Hey, it's the Analytics Dude, and I'm here with a full machine learning tutorial. For this tutorial, we're going to use the Kaggle problem called Titanic, Machine Learning from Disaster. There will be three parts to this. In part one, I'll cover the entire problem step by step from importing and cleaning the data. In part two, we'll use a random forest, which is a type of machine learning model, to predict who survives and who doesn't. And finally, in part three, we'll do some feature engineering to try to improve our model and our performance results. If that's the sort of thing that interests you, please subscribe to keep up with all of our updates. If you think this video is any good, please hit like, it means a lot to us. If you have any questions or comments, please throw them below in the comments box. I promise I'll get to them. Before we get going on this, please head over to the Kaggle site and download the Titanic datasets, as well as making sure that you have Nime installed in your computer. I'll include the links to both below. Sure, you could just follow along, but like Gary Vee says, you can't read about doing push-ups. You actually need to do them. The first thing to note is that we need to set up the problem to start. Most machine learning tutorials that I've seen miss this step entirely, but trust me when I say this, this is actually the most important part. When data science efforts fail to provide value, it's usually because the problem was set up incorrectly or scoped incorrectly, not because the model didn't work. Second thing to note is that we need to use a repeatable process or methodology. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to use the CRISPDM methodology. Now this is something else that trips people up in the real world. Is it a huge deal if your process isn't repeatable in Kaggle? No, not really. Is it a huge deal if a process mistake causes errors or delays in the real world? Yes potentially huge. The Titanic problem is a classification problem. You classify passengers as either survivors or, well, otherwise. Knowing that simplifies our modeling options. We're going to use a model called a random forest, which is something that past experience tells me will work rather well and is robust to overfitting. We'll talk more about why in part two. But there are other options. You could use a support vector machine, naive bays, k-nearest neighbors, or some boosted algorithms. But for our purposes, random forest should work rather well. If you want to try one of those other models, please go ahead and try. And post your results in the comments. I'd love to see how they turn out, and I'm sure the rest of the audience would as well. As this is a simple Kaggle problem, and hopefully a simple tutorial, I'll go over the CRISPDM methodology very quickly. CRISPDM is a six-part process that has specific tasks or outputs to each process. I'll include a link below that goes to the full document from an org called the Modeling Agency. This slide and the next one will also be available on the Analytics Dude site. On to business understanding. In this case, understand the problem. I like to state my preconceived notions in advance on this. On a bigger analysis, putting that in writing in advance can prove hugely influential and eye-opening to call out bias and evaluate how you work. As I said already, in the real world this is the most important step. More analyses fail to deliver value due to improperly framed problem statements or solutions goals than any other reason. In this case, our business understanding is that we want to predict, based on the data available, who will survive the Titanic sinking. My preconceived notions, based on, well, watching the movie Titanic, are that the important variables are, first, how much money you had, and second, whether or not you were a woman or a child. I'd be surprised if anything is more important than those, and if it was, I may not include it to avoid overfitting the model. Looking at the variables here in the Kaggle site, we, can, we see that we can use probably P-class for wealth, and then sex and age are, you know, pretty straightforward. Okay, from the task that we saw on CRISDM, it's now time to dive into the data. So the first step in that is we actually have to load the data in here so that we can use it. And that's part of input-output uh, with the CSV reader note, because this, this file is in a CSV format. So I'm going to use the CSV reader right there. I'm going to bring it in, configure it. Uh, normally you'd use browse, but I have it prepped, so it's right here. And looking over these options, we do have column headers, but there's no row headers, so I'm going to take that off and then let's execute this and see what we get. So the first step in um, exploring data is literally looking at the data. And so here we go. So passenger number, oh, I didn't actually need a, a row ID. I can pull that off, doesn't matter though. Uh, we see whether or not they survived. We see the classes. It looks like there's a lot more ones and threes and there are any twos. People's names, sex, age, and those red question marks are missing. So we see a lot of missing ages. And as I already said that I think that's going to be one of the important ones, so we definitely have to do something about that. Uh, whether they have siblings on board, whether they're the parents of children or children of parents, which is kind of odd, which they're on. Uh, ticket, just at a quick glance at it, that's not going to be useful for anything. Um, fares, probably just related to class. I don't think that's going to be uh, anything. Cabin, 
we don't know the map layout. That could be something <clears throat> we could use if we knew the layout. Um, but with so many missing values, I'm hesitant to really use it. And the what port they embarked in, um, I don't think that really matters a bit. Um, but that gives us a, uh, a look at that. The next step here is we're actually going to look at it a bit with the statistics node. Statistics is going to give us um, a good idea of you know what we're going to see here. So you pull up the node, connect it there, and then execute in open views. Boom, it's done. So here, uh, this is the part that I really wanted to. So this shows a couple different things to me. Uh, it has the histogram, uh, passenger ID that's obviously useless to survive. There's only two possible options. And the passenger class that we saw, there's um, a little less second class than first class, more third. We see the distribution of ages, as that looks to be about middle age. Uh, but the important thing I'm looking for here is we actually have 177 missing ages out of, I want to say, about 900 records. So that's going to be a problem. We need to fix that. Um, other than that, I think we're good here with this, uh, with these statistics. Now, in just about any other analysis, we'd go deeper here. But I have a pretty good idea of what I want to do, and I want to keep this video as short as possible. So on to data preparation. This data is in relatively good shape. So the only obvious things we need to do are fill in those missing variables and shift some of the other variable types of things we can work with in these models. The first way to consider that is what are we going to do about those missing variables. Since this is supposed to be a beginner tutorial, I'm going to go with the most beginner friendly option and just assign any missing values to the mean for that class. Obviously that's not ideal since we believe age is going to be important to our prediction, but um, that's what we'll do for right now. So the way we do this is use, utilizing the missing value uh, not not Joel, node. Missing value node, that's the one I'm looking for. So inside transform, use missing value. Um, we connect that to our CSV reader. Now we gotta configure it like any other node. So we configure it. The only one I care about, as I mentioned before, is age. Uh, there were some missing ones and other ones, but um, we're not really gonna worry about those other columns because we don't think they really mean anything. So age, we're gonna set it to the mean. That's how we do that. So let's execute that and check that it actually did it. Um, and it did. So our ages here, the ones that were previously missing, are now 29.6999, uh, which I'm just going to take the computer's word for it that those are in fact the averages. Uh, cabin, I'm, I'm not going to put cabin in my model since there's so many missing values and I have, have the slightest idea how this could be important. Um, and so we're not going to worry about it for now. And that's this uh, error that we're getting here, or rather this warning that we're getting here. Next up, we need to recast everything else that are integers to strings to make them class variables. This is important for our random forest model to work well. It needs those categorical or ordinal variables or class variables, however you want to say them. So the way we want to do that is, uh, now I don't remember exactly, but we're recasting a string, so let's type in string so we find, ah, number to string. So bring out the number to string node. Uh, low CD, I need those things to line up. Drag it across. Okay, we configure this. And this is what we're including, this is what we're excluding. I already mentioned before, I don't care about the fair. Uh, so I'm going to run with that one. Execute that in transformed input. How can you tell? Um, I didn't go over it before, but uh, now it's S's on top. S stands for string. Uh, they were previously I for integer, and then fair is a D for double. Now some people will tell you that uh, for modeling, you should get rid of uh, variables that you don't need. I personally like that. There are plenty of times you realize they mean something later on or figure out it might be nice to tie them to something. I prefer simply excluding them from the model without actually erasing them, so we're not going to drop any variables now. But the final step of ours is we'll partition our data to have some to build the model on and some to test it on. Do we actually need to do that? With the random forest, not technically. It's a bootstrap model and robust to overfitting, so it's not strictly necessary to do the partition. But we're going to do it anyways, because it's still good practice and it's unlikely to significantly hurt our results. So we go over here to our node repository, and we try partition. OK, so transform partitioning. Beautiful. Drag that in. And we're going to do an A20 partition. So absolute 100 records. No, we're going to go relative. And the first partition is going to be 80. 80%, which makes the uh, rest of it by default 20%. So we execute that, and boom, 80% of our records will be coming out of the top, which we can see is 712 rows. 20% will be coming out of the bottom, 
which we can see is 179 rows. So, you know, just back of the envelope math, that sure looks accurate to me. And now we're prepared to model this. See you in part two, where we discuss how to use the random forest model and actually build the thing.